we, we are at the top of the hour, so I'll kind of uh, begin informally here, is what Syzygy was saying. Uh, that's part of the point, is that, um, and I will talk, is that I've been fortunate to be in a lot of different types of forums to see how people work together and how they don't. <laughs> Uh, one of the more interesting ones, and so I've kind of, okay, I'm kind of beginning informally. Uh, my name is Phil Youngblood. If, uh, let's see, if you happen to be somewhat newer to Science Circle, you can uh, take a look at all our exciting events over here. And um, you can also catch some of these if you uh, search for them on YouTube a little bit later. Okay, so anyway, I've been in a lot of different situations where people work together, and like I said, sometimes not. And one of the more fascinating ones was I'm a retired military officer, and I was in um, Somalia with the United Nations, and I was also part of a, a animal staff at, with the Marines. And the U.S. Marines have a fantastic way of meeting together so that everyone involved feels like they're part of the group from the lowest to the highest ranks and everybody gets a good feel for if everybody knows what they're doing and uh, it just it's just a wonderful way to acknowledge both the individual and the group and everybody's role and part in it and I haven't seen too much in a civilian life to match it, but I'm going to talk about uh, some different ways that we do this together that are from several different disciplines. In other words, we often have presentations that are multidisciplinary and sharing about them. a group hug. <laughs> wow, feel free. Okay, so coming up here anyway, let's take a look. Now, a lot of, a lot of these are my own little devices here, and if you agree or disagree or whatever, let me know, is um, I was thinking about it, you know, uh, let's, let's uh, take a look at some of the definitions, it is a group is a bunch of individuals, in other words, we're a group here, that's why you're talking about a group hug, etc. We're a group, and the definition of a group is a bunch of individuals that have a common interest. In the case of the science circle, it's besides you know meeting a terror it's it's basically to foster open education in the sciences and but we're science and circles yeah okay uh circular argument okay so um but we're made up of individuals and the individuals have different personalities and to start with of course they have different needs and wants the graphics at the bottom of this slide, um, well, and that, that's exactly right. You know, you've just hit it on the head, is that one of the things about the science circle is, the reason I present is I like to learn, because <laughs> I want to lis listen to you and learn from you, and so that's why I, I like uh, the conversation and chat and stuff. And... You meet people from all around the world. You meet people from different perspectives. You have no idea who you're talking to until they start chatting or talking. Um, and and the science circle is a, uh, let's say I probably can't quote it, but basically we're a group of everything from science, vetted scientists and educators to science enthusiasts, uh, all different walks of life and ages and such. And so anyway, on this slide, if you're looking at a group, a group is made up of individuals. The present or the graphics on the bottom are from a presentation I did that says, um, "How do I live?" And it looks at uh, Maslow's uh, hierarchy of uh, needs or wants. And in some cases, I think those are some are needs, like physiological needs, safety needs, that sort of thing. But some of them, I think, are kind of wants. They're ones that we want to uh, have as we uh, have more experience with life. You'll also note that Maslow never intended it to be a pyramid like that. 
he intended it more to be like the one on the right, where you're continuing to have needs, but like when you're a baby, mostly it's physiological needs, and then as you mature, it becomes more uh, psychological and self. Well, <laughs> uh, okay, that was my own device. And what I'm saying is that if you're just in a group, like say, for example, it could be, um, <laughs> you're, if you're just in a group and you're not working towards a, a, a goal, that group could, the common interest might be, um, you know, running a country or something, or whoever's in charge of the country. And so if you're more toward the introverted side, you tend to be less engaged with people. And then, is my voice breaking up? Sorry, let me sit a little closer. Okay, so you may be less engaged with people if you're more likely, if you're more toward the introverted nature. Here, here introvert means that you are enervated by the presence of people that is not energized, but it, it saps your energy. Whereas extroverted, if you're with a group, you tend to be an activist or on the uh, far side, you could be a dictator rather than a hermit. Okay, that's just, that's my own device. You won't see any theories on that. Okay, next. <laughs> okay, but, so I'm establishing, oh, okay. Um, I'm establishing, um, and and I like the feedback too because I was kind of going, you know, dictator. I don't know. Okay. So, any case, now a team though is is a subset if you want to think of it as a group, but it's a it's a group of individuals that are working together, hopefully, towards a common goal. Can be sneaky. <laughs> Well, wow, could be. Okay. No, yeah, but, uh, okay. So, uh, so a team then is a group of individuals who's working towards a common goal. They still have their needs and wants and such. Yeah, it, not, not as a period. So I'm going to talk about three different areas uh, of going from uh, different focuses. In other words, one Project management, not not managers and leaders, but project management, tends to focus on work. In other words, workers are the same and people are the same and stuff. Now, if you're a manager or leader, you can't think that way. But essentially, it's focusing on work. Whereas the worker has to constantly balance. That's what the little thing in the middle. Uh, constantly balance between their needs and wants and the needs and wants of the group in order to achieve that common goal. So you've got, in the middle then, you've got the idea of being a member. Here again, I'm kind of going over some concepts. And so as a member then, we want to, in order for the team to be effective, we want to look at the concepts and theories and stuff of team development. Okay, so that's where I'm going. That's kind of my um, conceptual uh, framework for people that uh, like research terms. Okay, so let's look at project management first. Here again, I've mentioned that project management is methods and theories and blah, blah, blah of how do we get work done. Um, as I mentioned, when I was in Somalia on Admiral Staff and UN, UN and stuff, is that the consequences of not working together, getting work done, can actually be life or death. Whereas for in a company, you're talking about money and time. And before some of these things came together, uh, people wasted a lot of money and time and on occasionally lives uh, by not working well together. Um, so I, when, when uh, for example, when the um, SpaceX was launching their Starship, I was thinking, man, there is a lot of moving parts here, and I don't just mean the spaceship, is a lot of people have to be working together to make this happen. And the same thing, I was up since uh, early this morning, about eight hours ago, um, watching the coronation in the UK, and I found, and I, and I was thinking, boy, there's a lot going on here that people have to work it together 
to make it look like it's effortless, which it's not. Um, yeah, tiny sliver of the upper right. Well, you're right. And in fact, actually, let's see, I need to make sure I watch my hour here. <laughs> but let's go back to this one real quick. Whoops, where is it? Okay, you'll notice, as Baragon says, is that as you mature, self-actualization uh, becomes a more prominent part of your life because you found ways to meet the physiological and safety and that sort of thing. Okay, so that's kind of where we're going on there. So let's take a look at project management. Because what I do try to do is keep to an hour. And I usually can do that because uh, I've got a lot of practice doing it. Uh, no, it's not <laughs> at all. Um, wow, you guys are really hung up on that introversion <laughs> extroversion thing. Okay. Uh, but in truth, you have to be uh, aware of individuals and their characteristics and their wants and needs and the way they approach the world and uh, world viewpoints. And we'll be talking about that here in a bit. Okay, so now we're on project management. And in the concept of project management, we have to look at project, okay? So project is a temporary job. Now, by, by the way, uh, in the chat there, for those people that are, that are, one of the reasons I decided to do this is because we've got this big project that we're working on um, called uh, Project Moonbase, and it involves a lot of moving parts as well, and we're learning as we go along. So, so it reminded me of all these different uh, theories and methods and such like that for doing projects and about people and team development and all the rest. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at some definitions here. Is a project is a temporary job that produces something like that on the left. I mean, on the right. For example, if it's a coup, it's the overthrow of a government. That may not be a product or service, but that's a result. Or it could be a product, like a spaceship or a service, like um, um, helping somebody. Okay. Which are, in the lingo, they're called deliverables because you deliver one of those. And then, in theory, because it's a temporary thing, it has a start date, an end date, and it's performed by a team. Now, one of the things here, I'm not going to do this for all of them, but in our project moon base, one of the things that's different, and here again, if you find something different, uh, please put it in the chat. But it is, in theory, a temporary job, but one of the things we don't have is we have a start date, but we don't have an end date. In other words, we're going to continue working on it until we get tired <laughs> or achieve something. And so it's a little different in that regard. Um, now, when, they, when we say management, and I'm trying to put these into verbs, is manage is, um, wow, I'm glad all the chat's going on. Okay, is what you're trying to do is complete this project per the client's objectives. In other words, typically you're doing it for a client. You're doing it for somebody. Uh, they may not be even able to express all the requirements. Um, which we call requirements creep in uh, software development. Um, but in the moon-based project, we don't have a client. <laughs> so it's a little different. In fact, that's kind of why we're wrestling with the objectives, because we kind of have to make it up for ourselves. The project is for us at given constraints. And in, in the case of the constraints, we're not uh, trying to make a base on... Um, you know, Mars right now, we're talking about the moon. Uh, we don't have a time limit per se. Uh, we don't have a budget at all <laughs> um, because it's in Second Life, which is part of the advantage. But we do have a staff. So here again, those are the types of things that I, I'm trying to consider. Okay, so in project management, you have the concept of a leader versus a manager. Um, by the way, what I'm doing is, first of all, I'm doing multidisciplinary presentation, and I'm giving you several semesters of stuff all at once. So if it's kind of overwhelming or whatever, or if you've seen it before, or you can contribute, or, or you're an expert, uh, let me know. Okay, so 
what's a leader versus a manager? Well, a leader is more people oriented. The leader, the job of a leader is influence, to motivate, to enable. Whereas a manager's, a manager's job is to go, okay, uh, I know what I need to do. So it's more goal oriented, and the the manager then controls. Uh, they may still be a leader, as in helping people and motivating them and stuff. But their idea is to get the goal accomplished. It's to control the process, the work, uh, the people that are doing it. Um, that's kind of the difference there. When we say model, because I'm going to be showing model, um, second life is a model for first life. Uh, it's kind of, it's you know, a simplistic depiction. It doesn't have quite the detail. In fact, the resolution is what? One centimeter, right? As far as uh, detail goes. Um, it can create some, it's, it's a model for our minds and the way we envision uh, first life and also things that can't occur in first life. So you can see it as a model that way. But in any case, it describes uh, reality or even unreality that's in our map, mind. I'm reading map. Okay. So, but a model can be used for construction, for software, for writing a book, cooking a meal, almost any type of thing. The things I'm talking about can be used for a lot of those things. Okay, so where did we get project management? Well, not that long ago, if you think of the pyramids, if you think of uh, bridges, uh, a lot of that was actually managed or micromanaged, if you want to think of it, uh, by the people themselves, the sculptor, the painter, architect, builder, engineers. It wasn't until the 1900s where you started having some uh, bigger projects that required a little more of a systematic way of doing it, uh, particularly larger projects in, in the United States in the 30s uh, during the Depression and stuff. And then in the 50s after World War II when we were real re rebuilding the world, um, we meaning everybody. Um, and you had people like Gantt uh, come along and then there wasn't anybody named Perk, but PERT means Process Evaluation Review Technique. CPM means Critical Path Method. Uh, these came from both civil and from military approaches, uh, but they're still used today to be able to map out how it goes. Okay, now, a lot of this has been words on screens. I'm going to try, except for the first part, I'm going to try to do a bit more visualization here. Okay, so here we go. Is that uh, anybody know what kind of this is? Of course you do. It says it in the lower left-hand corner, right? I should have left that out. And, yeah, okay. Yep, Gantt. Okay, and Taylor, absolutely. There are a lot of people that uh, had a role to play in these. Now, on here, the emphasis on this is a Gantt chart. The emphasis on this, anyway, okay, here's, here's a question that I don't have an answer up there. Anyway, know what the WBS is? Because it's the next slide. Okay, for you um, people that have been in big projects, <laughs> possibly know what WBS stands for. Okay, so anyway, um, what you have here is uh, the activities. And on a Gantt chart, what they're looking at is, well, that's a good point, tagline. And it, there's a lot of, 1950 is a big break in a lot of stuff. So it's 1970. There's certain time periods that, a lot happened during those time periods. Um, big collaborative projects, absolutely. Okay, so what you're looking at here is activities that can be concurrent. That is, you can have several teams working on different ones at the same time. So for example, for the actual real return to the moon, you've got SpaceX working on the Starship, which a modified version will be used as the lunar lander. You've got a space station that's going to be put up around the moon called the Lunar Gateway. And then you've got the uh, European Space Agency and NASA working together uh, to get the astronauts to the moon. Uh, so those are three separate efforts uh, that, in other words, can be worked on concurrently. Whereas if you go on the x-axis there, you've got uh, the dependency. Um, yes, it does. It, it's 
and Morgan breaks it down. Now you're right, linear. The next one will be a little bit different than linear. Um, but if you look at these, you've got, you can see their dependence. In other words, that WBS 1.2 has to be completed before you can do anything else. And so that's dependent on that. So if you're a manager or leader, you're looking at that carefully to see if it's done. Okay, I got to keep moving because I've got a lot to go through. Okay, uh, WBS uh, means work breakdown schedule. There's also a process breakdown schedule. But in this case, if you're going to build an airplane, well, and that's the uh, problem sometimes a day is a lot of people want to just get out and build something. But if you're going to build something that actually has a, a lot of time, money, um, risk, all of that involved, you can't shortcut it. Um, you've got to do the planning and you've got to put in the work. Uh, in order to avoid it, because that's where all these models came from, was wasting millions of dollars and years uh, by kind of skipping some parts. And Peter Jerker is a good one to read. Okay, so anyway, if you're going to build an airplane, then it's broken down into these different um, levels. You got the 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 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, etc. Up at the top, and then you've got broken down activities. Okay, now here's another type of chart that's a little different, although you can actually turn these charts into each other. I'll show you here in a second how it works. Is a perk chart then defines the workflow. You don't see the sequential, you see a sequential left to right, but you don't see the time like you saw in the last one where it says uh, at this point here, this point there, this point that. But you do see the milestones. For, so, for example, in the, in the um, Gantt chart, you had uh, WBS 1.0. In this case, it's 10, 20, 30, 40. These are milestones. Um, okay, and Chad, anyone want to throw in what a milestone means in, in work, in, in project management? Well, I'm, so anyway, these define workflows. And then if you want to get a little bit more specific about what objects you're working from. In other words, when you say airplane, starship, <laughs> uh, or yeah, work breakdown structure. Um, okay, so if you want to get a little more specific, then there are a lot of other little tools, all software these days, is little, little tools, one called an entity relationship diagram. So for example, you can have an example of a student to a teacher or a student and then you got a school in there, and you got books, and you got the bookstore, and you got, you know, all of those sorts of things are all entities that are then related to each other. And so you can get down into the weeds, which you need to do if you're doing software and other things on here. Now let's take a look at how this can be turned into a Gantt chart. Essentially, if you look at it, you've got, in order to get from, there could be two concurrent things, in other words, 20 and 30 worked on at the same time, one takes three months, one takes four months. So you can see on that chart that there's about three pathways that you can follow. And uh, one of them takes three months and then another three months. Now, you'll notice that uh, how long does this whole thing take? Well, it takes seven months. And there are two actual critical paths, which we'll see in a moment. But one of them, if you go straight from 10 to 30 to 50, you'll notice that before you, 50 is going to take, to get to 50, it takes seven months. But uh, from 30 to 50 only takes three months, so you actually have what's called slack time. Now, if you're a manager, what, that, what you do is you take the people there, if they have the skills or whatever, and you put them over in one of the other teams so that they can make sure that uh, that, that gets done. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to work on this. You, like I said, I could talk for semesters on this. Uh, okay, and there's the critical paths right there. Because it, it's very complicated. And I'm, like I say, I'm throwing a lot at you in a short period of time. But I want you to get a feel for this, okay? Not master it, but get a feel for this stuff. Okay, so how does the focus uh, affect the outcome? Well, projects, since they're temporary, often lead into other projects. So you've got the project and you've got an output. And that output then can... Well, you're right, Sumo, and that's why the individual needs to be looked at. Who do you have on your team that can then 
both for their sake and the team's sake, who do you have that then can contribute in the area where they're gifted? Uh, absolutely, that's part of a good manager or even leadership. Um, okay, so in here you'll notice that if there's a project and it has an output leading into another project, then there's a lot of different ways that, well, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about personality here in a minute too. Because uh, remember, I've got three things to talk about. Project management, it's 25 after right now. Uh, person, uh, excuse me, team development and individual type traits, and then also working online, some of the peculiarities. Okay, so in this one, if you're looking more towards saving time and waste and all that, or getting a good uh, uh, return on your investment, then, that, then you're looking at one thing. If you're looking at bottlenecks and making sure that the project is, has to be done on time, because perhaps the next project needs it at a particular time, then you're looking at the critical path or bottlenecks. You could also be looking at simply the positive benefits. You could be looking at just what comes out. You could be looking at the interdependence. I mean, lots of different ways of, of approaching this. Now, this is very busy, but in project management, we often have these phases which can be called different things depending on whether you're talking about software or bridges or whatever, but uh, they got a lot to them. Just in the initial phase, you're talking about different analyses and how things are going right now and uh, what are you replacing and what, what the client requirements and the resources and the resource allocation and the uh, strengths and just stakeholders, people involved. I mean, so much involved. Just in feasibility alone, you're talking about do you have the software and stuff and computers or whatever to do it? Uh, what about legal issues? Should we do it? Moral issues? Uh, do we have the knowledge? Uh, what are the benefits and costs? Is it economically feasible? Uh, in other words, can we uh, pay for it over time or do we have to go up? Is it on schedule? I mean, so much to think about. It overwhelms me just to talk about it. So you'll also notice that uh, since this began in earnest in the 70s in particular, you've got a model over there that is good for a bridge. And it's good for something that you've done before, uh, the waterfall model. Um, by the way, if I'm putting you to sleep, it'll get more interesting. Because <laughs> I'll, I'll start talking about people uh, rather than work. This is, this, uh, this is right now I'm focusing on work. Okay, so you've got a waterfall model, which basically, you know, you, 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 these big long contracts, you sign it, and then uh, you'd better like, in other words, you're not going to be able to add another lane to a bridge once they begin building it, that kind of stuff. Whereas in these days, in this century, you've got more flexible types of um, models. One of these is called the Agile, Agile or Scrum model. This is uh, pretty new. And you'll notice that the waterfall model still works over on the right side of the slide versus in the middle of it. The waterfall model is good for when the details are known or decided. And when you don't expect a lot of change and you really can't have it, and you've got and you need and you can keep the this team stable during that time. So it's more sequential, dependent, that's sort of now. Today though, they know, well, that's doesn't describe the real world too well. Um, it's more like Complex projects, a lot of unknowns, uh, prototypes, do you like it? No, I want to change it. Um, <laughs> working in little sprints, like, you know, during a, a month and then you take time off, that sort of thing. And then, you know, that, that's kind of how we do it today. Now, that's also, our moon project is more like the one on the left, not the one on the right. Okay, so let's, speaking of which, let's talk then about how do, that's about work focus. So let's talk about, it's about half through the hour. Um, so let's then talk about um, team development. Okay. Um, in Tuckman's theory from 65 and subsequent, impro uh, not improvements, but tweaks on that more or less, you know, everybody wants to write a paper, is uh, you have 
different stages. I'm going to talk about uh, four different stages. One is the forming stage, where basically you're getting to know people, you're asking questions, you're really not very well informed about the issues or the objectives, and but you're trying to establish ground rules and uh, boundaries for the project, I mean, and people and their behaviors and all that stuff like that. And so in order to get beyond this forming, it's kind of a dependent stage where it's task oriented. In order to get beyond that, you've got to, somebody's got to take the lead and to uh, create uh, clear expectations uh, to identify the goals, um, to kind of share a mental model, to uh, create leadership opportunities, all that good stuff like that. And, okay. Okay. Because what happens is even in good teams, except for the ones that know each other, one of the advantages we had in our science circle is a lot of us have known each other for a very long time. And so while we could expect to have kind of a storming stage, meaning that people voice their opinions, they may not be the, the, the same ones, uh, there may be a little resistance or competition, uh, or emotions might get high because they really want to get something done, uh, that sort of thing, is that we were able to or are able to um, establish group norms and kind of instead of uh, and work out priorities and resolve personal clashes and all that good stuff like that. So the next one that um, teams may face, sometimes they never get past the uh, storming part. It depends on how strong a personality is and whether they're willing to cooperate and stuff. And so if you get to this stage, a lot of times it's because somebody's taken over as a leader or becomes a leader and then you get some cohesion in it. And so you're doing some reconciliation, lowering anxiety, setting standards, taking responsibility for such success of the team, accepting members uh, for who they are, uh, trusting each other to be able to share uh, potentially controversial tasks, stuff like that. Getting feedback, allowing transfer leadership, uh, that. Now, by the way, I don't have any single reference for this. This is a combination of references um, that I kind of synthesize. A lot of this presentation today is a synthesis, like I said, multidisciplinary, um, multi-approach, um, that sort of thing. Working from work focus to individual focus. Okay, if you can norm, if you can get to, to some norms within the team, then watch out because now you can perform and so in, in, a, in a performing team that's able to get over the, um, I'm reading tagline thing. Or shot. Yeah, uh, we still have a lot of trouble with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, in, the, in a team that's able to perform, by now they are accepting of each other, they understand they're working now towards a common goal. It's more of a problem-solving time, more interdependence, uh, rather, and you're working kind of in sub-teams. Um, so you're able to produce the results, to get to the goal, to, and so people want to learn then more about the objectives and the issues and they're more open, flexible. Um, they expect assent and they have norms uh, to be able to handle them. And so, but in order to get there, just like on the task management, you have to, or um, project management, you have to be able to set aside time to plan, uh, to engage with uh, the team leads, the members. Um, the teams can then perform without direct supervision, and but in some cases, the whole team then gets back together. Now, 
Now, bear in mind that it's possible that uh, with new members, new objectives, new conditions, that you may go back to some of the earlier phases and have to work through them. And the idea here is to then uh, celebrate your accomplishments and then decide and problem solve as a team. <laughs> Learn from each other, from each team. Okay, now, like I said, uh, the actual origin of this was a Dutch social scientist named Hofstede who was working for IBM. And IBM at that time was a multinational corporation, but they found that its individuals were very different uh, and uh, had a wide range of responses. So he wanted to understand more about why. And so he looked at uh, countries. Now, I'll get to that here in just a second. Um, because it's very difficult to go to a country and say, yeah, okay, everybody who's Dutch is like this, or everybody who's Iraqi is like this, or you know, everybody who's South African is like this. But he did tend to classify countries by certain characteristics. Okay, and it was a start. It's still, you know, it's still referred to um, as a start. Okay, the other thing, like I said, is the stages uh, may be different than just going one stage to another stage to another, just like in project management, it's different. Okay, now, uh, take a look up here. I thought this was funny. This is actually back from early uh, software development. Uh, you can read it, but yep, yeah, okay. And tagline, if you read, if there's a great uh, uh, three-part uh, series uh, called, um, uh, you, can, you can find the whole thing on, um, not Revenge of the Nerds, that's a Hollywood movie, but there is a BBC special in the 90s called Triumph of the Nerds, where it talks about IBM and their um, culture versus, say, Microsoft or Apple uh, and, and the different cultures there were essentially, yeah, oh, oh, please, it's, it's marvelous. If somebody wants to go there and give uh, the link to the first one, <laughs> it's at, because I could do a whole presentation on how, for example, the hippie culture led to the technology we have today. Uh, that'd be easy. Um, and you'll get that in, in that um, uh, YouTube video. Okay, so anyway, yeah, this the, that slide will be manifesto exactly. Okay, but you get you know this is very funny for anyone that's actually done it. But you get the enthusiasm and then the disillusionment and then the confusion. And in this case, since we don't have in our in our moon base one, since we don't have a budget, you don't have to necessarily uh, search for the guilty or punish the innocent or whatever. But usually, it's the people that are non participants that take credit. <laughs> Like the bosses, <laughs> you know. So it, it's. I just thought that was funny. Okay, so let's take a look then at the third part of the presentation. I'm um, 20 minutes left here. Is <laughs> well, exactly. The the moment you throw uh, money is the root of all evil, and I, I don't have to quote any uh, religious source uh, for that. <laughs> just follow the money. Okay, so uh, let's take a look then at individual characteristics. One of the things that Hofstede did was he looked at different nations on different dimensions. In this case, um, power distance, which meant nations that tended to, like if you're a professor versus a student, they tended to see the professor as well above them and not answer or ask questions, uh, let the professor talk, um, copy the professor's work. Uh, yeah, it's taking notes still. <laughs> okay. Um, et cetera. Um, well, you know, you know I, could do a, I could do a presentation just on note-taking. In other words, the, the psychology and stuff of um, hearing, write, processing, writing, reading again, you know, remembering, uh, all of that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Okay, so in um, any case, the individualism versus collectivism, you'll see, <laughs> yeah, okay, it <laughs> takes notes. Huh? Okay, uh, there is such a thing as taking too many notes. Okay, so anyway, the individualism versus collectivism, look at the difference. Look at the difference in there. You've got, in the, in the United States, it's higher than anywhere in the world. 
uh, UK is a little bit below that, is um, on individualism. That's why in the United States, there's a lot of people that if you say something like socialism, uh, it, it becomes a dirty word because the idea is you should not be dependent on other people. Uh, you should uh, do everything yourself, etc. That now, of course, that runs into trouble, etc. But whatever. But you see the vast difference there between, say, China at twenty and the U.S. at ninety-one, and then in between. And so you, you just that alone, if you've got a group of people from different countries, um, you have to take that into consideration. Now here, it's not just in some cases individual nations; it's part. So take a look at this. Now, this is actually from another uh, presentation I did on how do we live. And you'll see, look at Italy. It's a, it's a rainbow. It goes all the way from um, more of a uh, collectivist or, in other words, social, uh, thinking of family and, and, and group first before individual, down there in the boot of um, Italy, all the way up to hard individualist up in the uh, Po River Valley. Um, and the same thing with some of those others, all the way from the UK, very individualist, to, say, uh, Northern Africa. Um, very, very different just within uh, one area. But it makes a huge difference when you're working with people. Okay, then so also in this cultural dimensions, you'll see, for example, power distance. That is, that if you've got a... Um, Nobel Prize winner and somebody who's interested in whatever they won the Nobel Prize is that they might not even ask questions uh, because of the power distance. Whereas other people go right up and go, hey, there, uh, Dr. So-and-so, uh, I really liked your speech on, et cetera, that kind of stuff. Uh, same thing for uncertainty avoidance. If we've got, say, the moon base project where, hey, the whole thing's uncertainty. <laughs> it's, a lot of people may be very uncomfortable about that. <clears throat> or long-term orientation. In our moon base project, for example, we're going like, okay, this could last years. <laughs> and yet they're it depending on, uh, like in the United States there, uh, there may be a thing like, okay, if it's not done in three minutes, like a commercial, I'm moving on. Okay, so um, <laughs> these are different individual type of characteristics. Um, that you can that you can find. Now, I also this is from uh, some of my own work uh, that I published, but this is using Keller's Kelly's. Uh, it's a two-dimensional followership model, um, extreme moderation. Um, that's like extreme prejudice. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so not everybody can be a leader, and so not everybody can be a leader. Then you have to be a follower. Well, how do you follow? There are effective ways to fall, and there's not effective ways to fall. If you're passive and dependent, uh, in the group that I studied, you found that those are the people that are more critical of their experience because they're waiting for directions, um, but they're also dependent on other people to tell them what to do. And so other people are busy, so they're not, you know, they don't get stuff done, or they don't get what they want because they aren't telling anyone. Uh, or you may have the other extreme where basically they anticipate the needs and then they do extra tasks. And all the way through that whole spectrum there, you can read it uh, as well as I can on that. But um, I'm trying to remember what Kelly this was. <laughs> okay, so let, then let's talk about working online. Uh, we've got 15 minutes. Um, these are my little diagrams from some, like I said, from some research I did. Let's talk about school, work, internships, uh, Second Life, Science Circle, um, all that stuff. Well, uh, you're right, Baragon, and the there are advantages and disadvantages. You can, you can have something, you can have a place as individualistic as the United States, but the positive so the negative part of that is everybody's got a gun and if they don't like what you're saying they'll shoot you on the other hand uh they also come up with some very innovative ideas because they're not thinking like the col the collective culture 
or and they're able to say, well, this is what I think, you know, that sort of thing. So there are ways to, um, yeah, I, thank you, Christy. There are ways to handle all of this advantages and disadvantages. And so you need to kind of put it together. Um, and 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 both acknowledge differences, but also be able to work together as a team. So let's take a look then at some different ways people work together. In school, if you've ever been either a student or a teacher, which probably is everybody in the room, um, you've got what is expected as a student and a teacher, and then the remote barrier in between is just something you, you, you've got to, in other words, I, I'm talking, I'll talk more about that in a second, but you basically are overcoming this remote, this uh, barrier, but you still have the student-teacher relationship, regardless of whether they're co-located or not. Now, same thing with work. You've got a different relationship where basically the contract, so to speak, is work versus school, and you have different roles called worker versus supervisor on different expectations and stuff. Um, but then you've got, for example, you've got some ones which are kind of in between, which you've got an academic internship where you've got, basically you've got student, okay, which then moves over to the business if they can be co-located and becomes a intern under the supervisor. And if the supervisor knows that this is a student over in the school, then they won't treat them like a worker, or at least some won't. Um, but if you have a virtual internship, which was what my work was on, it's like, okay, there's a lot of ambiguity in here. They're missing the community. Uh, in other words, the people around the supervisor, they're missing what the community looks like and the building and the work and the pace and the everything. So there has to be a lot more communication in order to get things accomplished in a virtual Internship. Now let's take a look then at Sign Circle. Is the presentation I'm giving right now, except that of course the audience is uh, um, a lot more spirited than your typical student, and the power distance uh, thing is definitely not here, <laughs> which is good because <laughs> I like to facilitate. <laughs> um, <laughs> I like to facilitate discussions, not go, "Hi, I'm the teacher and you're the student." Okay. Um, so you've got these presentations, uh, yeah, really, you've got these presentations and you've got the attendee and the presenter, and we've kind of get through the, uh, remote barrier. In other words, I feel like I'm in the auditorium with the people. Now I'm facing the slide, otherwise I'd be seeing people uh, shoot spit wads or throw paper at me at, at the back of my head, you know, um. I don't think people do that anymore, do they? Okay. So anyway, and then second life is our, our environment. And then you've got uh, teams, in which case you've got a member and a lead. Yeah, it would be. Although I don't know that, you know, we have physics engines, so it's possible. Okay. Um, I'll bet you I could, I bet you I could do a spit watch shooter with, with um, physical objects and a little bit of um, uh, scripting. Okay. And so in any case, you've got that. And then the science circle, you've got members, which back in the old days, they said, oh, yeah, you know, tech is the limit. In other words, you can only do certain things in email. You can only do certain things on the phone. You can only do certain things on TV, uh, that sort of thing back in the 70s. But uh, I don't know if any there's any teachers in the area, professors, whatever, that have used quality matters. It basically says, I don't care what technology you're using. Um, this is how you interact with the people and get things done. So the discovery in my research was kind of to follow up on the quality matters is that it doesn't matter what tech you're using. It's the users <coughs> that use that in order to create the team, work together, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the other discovery was, hey, you know, we're all individuals. We approach things uh, differently. Yeah, penicillin was one happy accident. There's quite a few other ones. Uh, plastics, I think, was another one, um, right? Where you had to interface between two liquids, and it turned out to be really gooey, and you picked it up, and, it, you know, that kind of stuff, plastics. And then um, we also have different expectations. So, for example, if you came to this presentation 
and was expecting it to be, I don't know, a discussion. Um, you're only partly right because <laughs> of the chat. But if you knew in advance it would be like it is, uh, then great. Okay. Um, that sort of thing. Okay. So anyway, um, in summary then, I have 10 minutes. Hey, good. So uh, in summary then, if you look at the whole thing compared to our group and teams, the science circle is a group with a common interest. Our mission says that we, uh, are, we want to facilitate open education in the sciences. Okay. Um, the Moonbase project then is a collaboration of individuals from that group and others that are working together as a team towards a common goal. So it's not just participating like in here, but it's working toward a common goal, whatever that common goal is. Um, so now there's three, there's several ways then to approach it. A pro project management then requires understanding whatever requirements there are as they evolve. So for example, in our moon base, we're going, okay, well, uh, we need to let everybody know about it. Okay. So actually we did that. We had uh, a very good panel. You can find that one on YouTube too. A uh, very good um, discovery favors that prepared my, absolutely. I should have that above my door here. Uh, in, in my uh, high school gymnasium, it said, um, luck is when preparedness meets opportunity. I can still remember that one. But it's essentially the same thing. Um, but you, So we need to understand the requirements. Now, in the moon base thing, the requirements are evolving. We basically said, okay, we need to inform everybody of our project. So we had some a uh, panel presentation, a very good one that you can see on YouTube that we did both at this time period and then also for the 9 p.m. Uh, Second Lifetime uh, presentation. And then we said, okay, we need to have something physical. In other words, we were talking about, but we need to have something physical. And so if you'll go over to the display right outside the amphitheater, you'll see our first start. Uh, also, um, Cyrie's here, and his team is in scripting, and he's got over in his uh, prototype area, he's got a, a starship, full size too, and little moon buggies and stuff like that, which we need to have a link to so that people can go check it out. And so those are physical objects, and we need, and we're going to have to do some planning in order to achieve the goal of building a moon base because we want to build it realistically but those are a couple that's the goal is to build a moon base and then you know right now we're doing it in stages where we're going okay how do we get to the moon uh lunar space station and then finally landing on the moon building a base all that stuff so we're trying to do it in stages the same way as in first life because we want to try to make it realistic so team development then can be messy because you're dealing with people, you're dealing with individuals. But if you have the trust and you're willing to cooperate, you can get around those individual differences so that, again, the team can then work toward a common goal. Working online successfully then is about working together, not about the technology. You could be using the phone, you could be using, uh, um, streaming video on YouTube. You could be using uh, Second Life. Um, somewhere there's music, how thank you, Tim. Somewhere there's heaven, how high the moon. Very cute tagline. I'm glad it wasn't an Irish limit, limerick <laughs> or a dirty one. Okay, because I was reading it before I got to the end. Okay, so working online then has to do with people working together. It's not about the technology that connects them. It's about people willing to use that technology to work together. So the science circle and the moon base team then acknowledges, celebrates the diversity, reconciles differences of its individual members. <laughs> wow, 
now we actually talked about that. Uh, if you haven't been over to the other thing, we're going to have a, a tour in June. Um, we're working on there every week. Uh, the moon base, uh, well, we don't have a moon base yet because we've got a planet, but we have a work area. In fact, we have a couple work areas. But we've acknowledged that we need eight different teams, okay? For you guys that are on the, the, the project, I'm going to try to uh, spell out the teams here. I've got five minutes. Um, we've got science and education because that's our um, mission of, our, of Science Circle. We've got construction and scripting, because those go together. We've got psychology and ethics, and we've got writing and outreach. Hey, I got them. Yay! Okay. Um, partly because of that, I could see the build that, that we have. But we've got all those different teams that all then have to work together and be interdependent on it. Okay. So that's my presentation for today. As I said, it's kind of interdisciplinary. It tackles everything from um, models and of uh, process of being work-focused, trying to get um, about team development, and then finally acknowledging both individuals and the idiosyncrasies of working online. Moon River. La, 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 la. Okay. Well, um, Sumo, I don't think it's classified. <laughs> um, I'll let me see if I can. Um, I, in fact, I know it isn't. Uh, but <clears throat> essentially, it wouldn't work here <laughs> because uh, essentially you've got a colonel in charge, and what he says goes. But he wants to know that everything, everybody knows what they're doing. And so you've got different teams that have to work together, where essentially you can have somebody that's at a very low rank that gets up and goes, okay, here's what we do. By the way, this is, uh, here's, here's what we're doing. Here's uh, the timing. Here's who we have to coordinate with. Um, people then ask questions. They go, well, what about this? Have you thought of that? Uh, Etc. And then the other team gets up and basically does sa same sort of thing. And the colonel listens, and then at the very end, the colonel says, "Okay, uh, this is what we're going to do. Uh, here's the changes because of the weather, resources, or whatever. And okay, let's go do it." And essentially, that's the synopsis of how they do it. But it, it's, it's superbly done. It acknowledges the uh, skill of everybody. It tests what they are doing, when and with whom. Um, and then they go out after a common goal, basically what the colonel says, and they do it. Yeah. Well, you're right. Um, and a good team will do that. They acknowledge the individuals. We have two minutes. Uh, acknowledges the individual. It tests for um, knowledge, competency, resources. People can ask questions. There's no judgment. It's all working together because they know very well that their lives could be dependent on it. Uh, they're all comfortable with what the other person says because they know that they know what they're talking about, and they have the resources, and they, everybody gets a question to ask. Um, and then there's somebody who says, this is what we're going to do. And so uh, to me, that's the best way I've seen to do it. Uh, colleges can't work that well. <laughs> OK, after 25 years of <clears throat> um, experience teaching <laughs> in the university, uh, I haven't seen it work that well in a lot of places. Okay, and uh, Tagline, as usual, has some very interesting stuff. So I'm going to quit talking, and I'm going to wrap it up. And thank you all for coming, and I appreciate it.